so good to see all of you here. I just want to begin by thanking the organizers of Interdisciplinaria, especially Sankalp and Laksh and Yasha, and all the others who've done so much work, including feeding us sandwiches and giving us water right before we came up here, because clearly we need our strength to face a fearsome audience like all of you. Um, but it's good to see you, and thank you to all of you for organizing this. Um, my talk today is called Desiring Delhi. It's uh, part of a new book I'm working on, and this is the first airing that this book is getting. So um, it's in a very nascent stage. I would love to hear from all of you your thoughts on this. Um, this is a book, it's supposed to be a crossover book, so not entirely an academic book, called A History of Desire in India. And this is one of the chapters on that, on, on desiring Delhi. And the question that I want to ask, and I do ask of this in this chapter, is about whether cities can feel desire. Because usually when we think about desire, we think about it as having human agents and human subjects. And so my question is, can cities feel desire? And if so, what form does that desire take? And since this is a conference about crossing borders and crossing boundaries, I'm taking that invitation literally, and I want to begin by thinking about what it means to cross borders. And so I want to show you all a little um, clip, an ad, that no doubt all of you have seen before um, and all of you have cried over before. And so if you cry today too, I'm not responsible, of, responsible for it because you've cried already, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. And... Um, ये मैं ये यूसुफ लंबे आरसी लाहौर में हमारे घर के सामने बड़ा बाग था उस बाग का गेट बाबा ने बनवाया रोज शाम को अपने माँ पतंग उड़ानी और उसके बाद जाके यूसुफ की दुकान से जो जरिया चुरा के खानी जो जरिया
This ad was called The Reunion. The Reunion is successful because it is a well-made film with an emotionally resonant soundtrack. But it makes us cry also because it taps into three reservoirs of emotion that run deep in the subcontinent. The first reservoir, incredibly rich, historic, and intense, is the socio-sexual bond between men. Delhi has a long, publicly recorded history of male homosexual cultures. The great poet Mir Taki Mir claims in the 18th century that the boys of Delhi with their caps awry have destroyed their lovers. Such a culture was not only homosexual, but also homosocial, with men publicly bonding with each other. Indian men have inherited this tradition fully. Even when they are not sexually involved with one another, they openly hold hands and walk with their arms around each other. The male-body relation is considered to be a man's primary emotional bond, and the yarana, or male friendship trope in Hindi cinema, is living testimony to the emotional strength of this bond. Exemplified poignantly by Amitabh Bachchan, Shashi Kapoor, Rajesh Khanna, Amir Khan, Saif Ali Khan, and others, the yarana that exceeds barriers, that breaks boundaries, exerts a strong pull on the Indian psyche. Equally intense is the relationship between cities that Google flaunts by using both Delhi and Lahore as the physical backdrop for the film. We see Delhi's Jama Masjid and India Gate and Lahore's Badshahi Mosque. The architectural features of the two cities bring into focus the emotional bond of the two men. Just as the culturally rich Lahore and Delhi are often considered twins of one another, so too are we asked to think of Baldev and Yusuf as twins separated by a cruel fate. Cities and men are both considered yars. And finally, the film uses explicit reference to the traumas of partition in 1947 to create its emotional impact. Against this backdrop of nostalgic men and bloody partitions, the film envisions the possibility and the fantasy of reunion between cities and people across time and historical scars. The ad is successful then because it touches a nerve that far exceeds the lived experiences of any individual Indian or Pakistani. It taps into a collective and historical desire by which we continue to be marked today. This ad is only two years old, but it touches all of us even today. The ad reunites Baldev and Yusuf, but equally, it brings into frame a love affair between cities and history that have been riven by partitions. Can cities love one another as much as two men can? Can Lahore feel a desire for Delhi that is matched by Delhi's yearning for Lahore? If cities are major players in the drama of desire, then what is striking is the way in which the cities themselves, and not just the inhabitants, play this role. We can ask, therefore, how does Delhi feel desire? What shapes its desiring configuration? How does one feel desire for Delhi? Much like the city's historical and monumental structures, this question too solicits a multi-layered response. And today I will just touch on two of those layers. The first involves the pain of partition, and the second paradoxically suggests the increased desire that is engendered by such repeated loss. Intazar Hussain describes an occurrence that takes us back all the way to 300 BC, at which point Delhi was called Indraprastha and was the home city of the Pandavas in the Mahabharata. Hussain insists that the idea of loss generated as recently as the exile and migration during the partition of 1947 is a repetition of what people have experienced since the days of the Mahabharata. Even in those days, he says, the partition of the land and the kingdom between members of the same family was a violent event. Partition, then, is a repeated occurrence in Delhi. 1947 is only the most recent example of a violent tearing apart. But even though Delhi has been witness to several partitions, perhaps the most consequential to a history of desire, even more than the 1947 partition on which the Google ad depends, is the bloody battle waged here in 1857. These uprisings were not the first that Delhi had seen and nor were they the last. But this first war of independence against the British, this mutiny, 
tried to change the patterns of desire in the city. The British were famously conservative about mixing with Indians resident in the country. Unlike the denizens of Delhi for centuries before them, all of whom lived here and intermingled both socially and sexually, we can move, the British passed laws in the 1820s preventing miscegenation. Rulers before them, from the Chauhans onwards, regularly married locally and became assimilated in the, into the cities of Delhi. This process of desirous assimilation was such a strong current in the city that the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, builder of Delhi's iconic red fort, was three quarters Rajput, one eighth Persian, and one eighth Central Asian, of which half was Mughal and half Turkic. In other words, this Mughal emperor was only one sixteenth ethnically Mughal. The Chauhans, Tomars, Lodhis, Mughals all became Delhi, but not so the British of the 19th century, despite their massive building projects across the city. Thus, the Battle of 1857 was nothing less than a war between two versions of desire. The first was a mingled hybrid desire in which sexual inclinations, languages, religions mingled widely over the centuries without being able to tell where the one ended and the other began. The second version of desire, what was at stake for the British, suggested absolute mo moral difference between religions and desires as well as a hierarchy among them. This was the version that resulted both in the Indian Penal Code of 1860 and the Section 377 that's being fought in the courts is an inhabitant of this penal code. It resulted both in the Indian Penal Code of 1860 and the partition of 1947, this idea that things can be completely separated and put into different categories. Though focusing on 1947 then, the Google ad picks up also on this moment of sundering in 1857 when the Red Fort moved from being the beating heart of the capital city to becoming a barracks in which the British lived. Cultures were torn apart, and Delhi was subjected to a loss from which it has been almost impossible to recover. The sense of loss, however, has given rise to a stubborn insistence that partition can be reversed. The script for Baldev and Yusuf's tearful reunion draws its material then from a traumatic history of repeated partitions, a desire for a glorious Delhi, and finally, the desire to undo partitions' worst fall and woes, even if only in fantasy. What marks Delhi's desire then is not only that it has frequently hosted cross-dressing mushairas or poetry sessions, or that its patron saint Nizamuddin Aulia was the subject of Amir Khosrow's love poetry, or that its High Court in 2009 read down the phobic Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. What marks Delhi's desire is that it is inevitably linked to partition and loss. Conquerors and poets from Afghanistan and Central Asia and the Deccan and the Western Coast and Persia have all won Delhi, but they have also all lost it. So much so that the desirable idea of possessing Delhi is always tinged with the thrilling possibility of losing Delhi, or of possessing a Delhi that is present only as lost. But the desire for Delhi, the desire in Delhi, the desire of Delhi, is marked not only by ideas of partition and loss. This desire is also marked by its profusion, by the way in which it has accreted over the ages rather than being diminished. The longings of its multiple inhabitants from different parts of the world have not been replaced by each new ruler, but have gathered layers against which one continues to stub one's toe while walking around the city. Rather than a diminution then, loss here has resulted in a profusion. There is simply too much here and has been for centuries. Delhi loses its charms, sees them go to seed and then witnesses new ones rise up in their place. And even when the new ones go up, the old ones have not gone away. They live on in poems, legends, and sometimes even as the architectural base for other monuments. Delhi is a city of desires that overlap with one another messily, where the past can never fully be put behind us, but continues to haunt our present. Take, for instance, the famous Lodi Gardens. 
Its compound has been built alike by the Lothis in the 16th century and the British in the 20th century when Lady Willingdon organized the site into an English park. Men and women nestle against one another in the undergrowth and within the walls of its ruins. The loss of the Lothis forms the bed on which lovers live out their desires. They come here to kiss and fondle in partial view of the walkers. Men walk about holding hands, not exciting comment or stares. Women saunter by themselves or in pairs. Like other parks in the city, Lodi Gardens accommodates lovers of all stripes. Unlike some other parks though, these different lovers blend into the many layers of history that forms their bedroom. The ghosts of Delhi past, illuminated at night in the tombs of the Lodis, have generated desires that are steeped in the city, no matter what the demographic of who might be living in the city at that moment. Delhi allows us to think about desire then, not just in relation to human actors, but also in relation to their physical settings, mangled histories, and a collective sense of loss. The wealth of poetry about the city, for instance, speaks of its monumentality as being a cause of desire. This monumental desire has been commemorated in Braj Bhasha, Persian, Hindavi, Hindustani, Hindi, and Urdu. In a recent Nazam or poem, Muhammad Alvi des describes Delhi's desire in a language that is itself multiple and takes cognizance of the fact that the city's physicality is at the heart of its desirability. And I will just read the, um, oh, this is the English translation. Okay, I'll read just the English translation. Delhi, the moat in your eye is the Qutub Minar. Delhi, your heart of stone is the Lal Kila. Delhi, in your wallet you have Ghalib's grave. Let it be, old Delhi, do not take off your clothes. The Nazam suggests that the ruins of old buildings are sexy. Delhi's monuments limb the city's physical space and become, in a slightly creepy way, marks on its body to be caressed and lingered over on the one hand and covered up and protected on the other. Delhi is both old and has an old Delhi as its soul. It is a beloved whose desirability exists as a thing of the past, but which is no less a thing of beauty because of that pastness. Indeed, there is a timelessness to this idea of Delhi as a destroyed and magnificent profusion. So much so that even a lament for Delhi's lost glory ends up paying homage to its unsurpassed beauty. Jan Nisar Akhtar's despairing couplet, and Jan Nisar Akhtar is the father of Javed Akhtar and the grandfather of Farhan Akhtar, who is probably the only Akhtar you know. Um, Jan Nisar Akhtar's despairing couplet, and again I'm going to read just the uh, English, and I think we can move to the next slide. Delhi, where are your glorious streets? I now walk down your roads with my head bent in shame. Even this cannot but stand testimony, testimony to the glory of Delhi. The strain of nostalgia repeatedly attached to the city suggests both that Delhi's desirability is past and that the city is the current object of desire. After all, Delhi is the addressee of the poem in the current moment. Equally for Akhtar, it is the streets of Delhi which are described as beautiful, the physical structures on which we walk. The destroyed garden is both dead and blooming in its physical decrepitude. The heart or dil is worthy of being in Delhi because Delhi and Delhi streets have desire in them. What is particularly crucial about paying attention to these streets is that they sidestep our usual conversations about human sexuality. Or rather, they lead us up a different path both temporally and spatially. The desire of Delhi is not equal to the desire of the people who currently live in Delhi. At the very least, it also includes the desires of those who have lived in Delhi for centuries past and ever since. Equally, the desire of Delhi is not a desire about individual human beings and their sexual proclivities, no matter over how long a period of time. Desire here is rarely about individuals. Instead, it involves non-human actors as much as it does people. It shows us that cities too can be marked, traumatized, emboldened by desire. Buildings speak, monuments extol, tombs announce, Ruins declaim, 
Houses embrace, streets kiss, bowlies tremble. Desire in Delhi is animalistic, monumental, and streetwise, every bit as it is human. The desire of Delhi, the desire for Delhi, involves an entire landscape of buildings, ruins, foods, poets. It is based on dilapidation, depredation, fashions, and partitions. Desire here is not a sentence that stops. It extends outward to Lahore, to other cities, deepened by partitions, and expanded by a sense that far from being diminished, it burns more brightly in the fires of loss. Delhi is the land of desire without end.